Okay, well, first off, congratulations. We can call it beginner's luck. <laughs> <laughs> and, Thank you. <laughs> and uh, um, in the Zen, they have the concept also of beginner's mind. Mm -hmm. Of course. But the beginner's mind here that they're talking about in the sense of never mind, start again, just go it over again. Never mind that. In other words, if you do something and fail at it, then uh, that attitude will bring about. You've heard of the Aesop fable, the uh, uh, the fox and the grapes. Maybe. OK, there's an Aesop fable of where the uh, the grapes are high up and the fox is trying to grasp them and he'll he'll take a running jump or he'll try to crawl up the tree and finally he can't get the grapes after a few tries and he'll walk away with the thought, well, the grapes were sour anyway. In other words, it wasn't really worth the effort. All right. And that's what happens when we fail at something. Then we get the idea that it really wasn't worth our effort anyway, rather than because um, it's, it's quite possible that you're that you're not going to get the grapes, but we don't have to trash the grapes mm -hmm. just because we can't get them. Uh, and so um, when we're practicing correctly, though, we can get those grapes. We can do it. It's possible to do that. Now, in the regard of this um, point, the grapes are actually the feelings of satisfaction, safety, security, comfort. This is um, actually the in the Pali dictionary. This is the definition of sukha. These are also uh, powers. There's a word called iti, and it's used idiopata, and the word iti is, um, there's a Sanskrit word that's similar to it called sittis, and that the sittis then are referred to as the magical powers that you will have in Hinduism. And the magical powers are like swimming in the dirt, uh, walking on water, um, there's a whole list of them. In fact, I just saw that list just yesterday. And I saw it in the context of the Sutta number 12 in the Majjhima Nikaya, where the Buddha was, um, actually it's worth going into just a little bit. Uh, the, the Sutta is about, or starts off with um, someone whom Sariputta sees while he is out on arms round, and this guy has a kind of a small group around him complaining about the Buddha, saying that the Buddha exhibits no uh, supernatural powers, and that uh, the only thing that the Buddha teaches is uh, uh, suffering and the relief of suffering and the removal of it, and he's pretty good at that. OK, and when Zariputta comes back and tells the Buddha this story, the Buddha then says uh, that he's praising me when he tries to blame me, because that's in fact all the Buddha does teach is Dukkha Dukkha Naroda. That's the whole teaching. There's other suttas that points that out. And here this guy is angry because that's all the Buddha then teaches. And then the Buddha says, uh, how can people get ideas from the teachings that go like that? How can people see that kind of stuff and think that there are uh, the teachings of the Buddha are something that's different, that they're the magical powers, the cities, rather than the itia uh, that the Buddha has, uh, which are the foundations of the of that power is actually aspects of the Eightfold Noble Path. 
everything gets really repeated over and over again. And when you have four of this and five of that and six of that, a lot of students fail to understand it because the poly is using slightly different language, that these are actually different things to where in fact they're the same thing over and over and over and over again, just looked at from various aspects. So the idiopata means uh, the word pata is like the word pedal or the foundation, a pod, et cetera, like that in our language. And the uh, the foundations of this power, uh, these spiritual powers, is mindfulness, investigation, effort, and right attitude. Those are the actions. Just right there in the pot is just like I can't believe that that's the way that it's looking. You know. So these are the power. These are the foundations of power, and the powers themselves is the power of feeling safe, the power of feeling secure. The power of feeling comfortable, the power of feeling satisfied. And then the ultimate power on top of that is the feeling of success. When that success is added, that's like the wow, that's the change of attitude that gives us the attitude of winner. I can do that. Now, most of us, when we're children, we're raised in the victim's position little kids start off as victims they need to be taken care of in the beginning and so we start off as victims and then we're told to do we're told to do your abcs learn your one two threes go clean your room put down your cell phone and do your homework and all of this are victims positions of being told what to do when we're little kids and so we grow up with that victim's mentality of I can't do it alone, I need help. And that I can't do it alone, I need help is also based instinctually, is part of the nesting instinct or the herding instinct or our societal instinct. That I can't do it myself, but society will do it for me. I cannot have a beautiful Christmas on my own, but then there's Santa Claus. And with Santa Claus's help, I'll have a marvelous Christmas. This is the mentality that we have, which then uh, there's unfortunately, even though that's true in many cases, there's one place where it cannot work. And that is, is that within one's own mind, no one can change the thoughts that you're having. That cannot be done. That when a student, a piano student goes to his piano class, the teacher can see what he's doing, can hear what he's doing. When the meditator goes and sits in the meditation hall, we might be able to see some movements that he's making, but nobody really knows what's going on inside that guy's mind. If nobody knows what's going on inside that guy's mind, not even that guy, then who's going to help him change his mind? That's the victim's position of, oh, poor me, I need a guru, I need a doctor, I need a psychologist, I need a priest, I need, I need, I need, I need, because when we were babies, we did need. But now that you're an adult, you don't need anything. You've got the skills that you need yourself. That's the right attitude is to say, yes, I can do this. Yes, I could do this. I can build those powers. Yes, I can feel secure. Yes, I can feel safe. Yes, I can feel comfortable. Yes, I can feel satisfied. And yes, I can feel successful. That's the practice, okay? And in that regard, it's not really philosophy at all. I don't know where philosophy would fit in there, but in fact, you could go so far as to say philosophy is irrelevant in the sense that people can do philosophy and feel really bad. You can have two philosophers tearing each other apart. It happens often. <laughs> and then you can have two philosophers that philosophize together get into harmony. And so it's not the philosophy, it's the harmony that we're looking for. Okay. Okay. To, to get at, in tune with nature to get in fact, uh, to become uh, integrated or whole, a unified mind is what we're looking for. 
Now, a lot of people think that means to be at one with all or with everything. Uh, and, and that brings on the joke of uh, the Dalai Lama goes to the UN for a conference. And while he's there, he's out on the street and he sees a, a hot dog vendor. And so he goes to the hot dog vendor and says, make me one with everything. Right. <laughs> make me one with everything. You know, that sounds quite Buddhist. But all the Dalai Lama got in that case was a hot dog. Okay, that make me one with everything is not actually what is the real practice. The real practice is make me one, period. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's come out of the crowd that's in the mind and get some organization in there. Um, this is what the word samati means. It means that things are correctly organized to correctly put together. A simple example of that is a Western American Indian uh, Native American teepee. Why? Because regardless of how many poles that teepee has, some of them have only four poles for little kids teepees, up to 20 or 30 poles around. But all of them have the, uh, the quality of fairly close to one end of it. All the poles are tied together in a bundle so that when the long part sticks out, they, that tie point then gives stability all around the circle. That is what we would call a samati point. Many buildings in Asia are made with a samati. Another um, example of that would be like the Capitol building has a samadhi. There's one point, that's the top, the apex, everything. And in fact, uh, you could also think of that as an arch because the dome is nothing but an arch, that's cir a circular arch. But we have that, uh, and it has that stone or that ridge pin in there that holds that arch together and makes it really, really strong. That's what we need to do with the mind. And yet, in fact, what we have is we have a crowd in the mind that normally is a dialogue between the parent and the child where the, the parent goes around telling the child what to do and then the child resents it and doesn't want to do it, but does it anyway, goes along to get along. So uh, an easy example is the guy is sitting there watching um, a YouTube movie or something like that and the thought comes up, you ought to be meditating. And the answer to that is, I'm not, I don't want to meditate right now. I want to watch the video. And then a half a second later, another thought comes up. You ought to be meditating right now. And then the next thought is, I don't want to. Well, that's the dialogue between the parent and the child. And the parent goes around giving us marching orders. We learned that when, when we were children. Our parents tell the child what to do. And the child does what he's told to do, but he doesn't like it a bit. And so now we're telling ourselves you ought to go meditate and, and immediately the child is going to rebel against that because there's no unity there. And not only that, but there's a third element in there and that is the observer or the watcher or what we can call the, uh, the human part of the brain, the frontal cortex. You can also call it the one who is alert and aware. This is what we mean by sati is to wake up that frontal cortex and look at what the parent and the child are talking about. Look at their dialogue because we're going to uh, assist the parent ego state from and to come out of their critical. This is good. This is bad. You ought to do this. That's good. That's bad. I like this. I don't like that. All of that critical in comparisons. And we start to put nurturing thoughts in the mind or in the uh, the voice of the parent. So when the parent is is nurturing, the child feels nurtured. A way of talking about it is, is that you have spent your whole life talking yourself into feeling bad. Now it's time to talk yourself into feeling good because that's going to help integrate and unify the mind so that we become whole, a whole human being that has just one um, viewpoint rather than scattered around uh, in controversy. This is good, this is bad, I like this, I don't want that, I don't want to do this, yes, I know I should, all of those kind of thoughts. 
And we begin to pay, pay attention to that, to wake up to it and to recognize I do not have to be critical. I do not have to continuously have thoughts that give me work to do, that keeps me unsettled, afraid, uptight, uh, insecure. That I can in fact have thoughts or words to say that actually make me feel safe and secure. You can look around and you can say, hey, wait a minute, this place is empty of dangers. There's no danger here. Why do I feel insecure and and unsafe when the intellectual part of the mind knows that right now in this particular moment, there's no danger? So we have to talk to ourselves about that and say, look, there's really there's no I can relax Friday and what a relief it is. Oh, there's nothing dangerous right now. Isn't that marvelous? But we're so used to being in a state of danger that we will actually have the danger to create or the feeling of danger to create the danger. I see that often in all kinds of ways. One of them is, in fact, uh, the the we, because of the coronavirus, there are several new delivery companies. Everybody's doing everything by delivery now here in Thailand. The stores deliver and uh, uh, you have the government post office, but then you have carry and fast express and all of that. So when these guys come to bring the um, something to the house, the dogs will bark. These guys are all afraid of dogs. I don't know why. And because they're afraid of dogs, instead of just getting to deliver the goods and you take off on their motorbike, because the motorbikes are much faster than the dogs, they hem and haw and wait around and look at back and forth of where's the dog. They're actually inviting the dog to attack them because they're afraid of the dog. Instead of having the idea, hey, that dog is slow and my motorbike is fast. I'm out of here. Isn't that interesting? Now, I know all of this because I delivered newspapers in high school and I had to deal with every dog in town. <laughs> and there was one or two dogs in particular that I had a whole lot of fun with. And why is that? It's because I would drive just slow enough to where the dog could get almost close to me. But then, depending upon which side of the, uh, uh, the motorbike the dog was on, I would go very close to a car so that the dog trying to bark at the motorbike would run himself right into the back of the car. I felt really good when I could look in the rearview mirror and see that dog had stopped. <laughs> and so, yeah, if these guys are really sharp about it, they could run my dog right into a tree. Because there's a lot of trees around here, but they don't. They're they're afraid. This is an important point to recognize how much of your behavior is based on fear. And by being afraid, a, a dogs are a good example. The dogs do not harass and handle or uh, bother the people who are not afraid of them. They only harass and bother and bark at and chase down people who were afraid. How do the dogs know they're afraid? Well, there's two ways. One is that they stink with fear and the dogs can pick that up. Humans, we're not olfactory enough to where we can really smell fear, but sometimes you can. And the other part is, is that you can see it in behavior. They act uh, afraid. They act overly cautious, which means not up to speed. They jerk and pull around and things like this. So. This is something to really start paying attention to is, are you afraid or not? What fear do you have? Because the fears that you have will actually, um, let us say, help determine what kind of thoughts that you have. You could go into any, let us say that there's a business meeting and that someone has a problem, he got stopped by the cops or something like that, and he walks into this meeting fearful. 
because he has the basis of fear, his thoughts about the meeting, even though he's thinking about the meeting, he's still feeling afraid. And all of his thoughts then about that meeting were going to be negative. All that prob that probably won't work. Oh, why should we bother to do that? It'll probably fail, right? He's actually uh, divided. He's not unified. He's feeling one way and trying to take care of some other business. It's better if we take care of businesses that we feel really good. But this is one of the ways of looking at a lot of people think. And, and in fact, I've even had one guy say that, oh, if I felt good all the time, I'd never get out of bed. And my answer to that is, well, that's not a bad idea then. <laughs> yeah, you just lay in bed all day, except that nobody does that. We will all figure out something. We will all have a moment of lapse of mindfulness. We will all think of something bad to, uh, that needs to be done or something, and we will get up. But the question is, is that not to stop doing, but rather to withdraw for a while and get the mind into a really good state and then go back and do the business in a good state that you're more than likely say to write an email in a really good state and get a better email out of it than if you write that email with dread, worry, anger, frustration, because that frustration, anger, worry will come out in the email. And if you be really good, that will come out in the email also. And so I'm not saying to stop and stop doing everything i'm saying stop doing everything until you feel good and then go do whatever you want to do there's a bible passage that way in the sense of whatever thy hand findeth to do do with all of thy mind all thy strength and all thy heart which means put some skin in the game pay attention to what you're doing do it well rather than doing it sloppily because we're worried about something else or worried about how bad this thing is. Let's get our mind in really good shape. That's the practice of, of the Buddha. Not very much philosophy there, actually. It's attitude but first. Right? Attitude is a major skill to be developed. It's the fourth item on the list because this attitude cannot be just merely developed. It has to have success as its foundation. This is why the Buddha actually says it this way, that that right view, right investigation. Now, when we say view, we're not talking about a viewpoint or a concept, a world view. We're talking about an investigation. And in fact, you could say uh, that it exemplifies in uh, Dr. Watson and uh, Sherlock Holmes. That Dr. Watson was a philosopher and he had all kinds of data and information, but Sherlock Holmes had a magnifying glass. Right? He's actually doing an investigation. One is pondering and participating and thinking about things, and the other one is actually looking. And he's the one uh, that, that sees because he's looking, and the one who's thinking about what he sees is just lost in space. So this is an actual open investigation of what's happening in the mind in this moment. And when we see that that's an unwholesome thought there, we can say, aha, I see you, Myra. Aha, I see that unwholesome thought. And that that is a new thought that's completely healthy. Aha, I see you is a change. One of the ways of looking at it is, is that when we're having unwholesome thoughts and the thoughts are just spinning, we think those thoughts are me. This is my thought. My thoughts are good thoughts because I'm a good person, right? This is the normal way that people think. But when we start investigating those thoughts and recognize I'm attached to that and it is running me around, and then I can say, aha, I see you, Myra. That moving away means actually that we're disassociating from the self. In that particular instant, in that particular moment, we separate ourselves from the self that was that thought. And now we're recognizing I am not that thought. That's just a thought. It's not me. 
Uh -huh, I see you. I see you, the thought. That means that we're separating it and, and that I see you is actually the frontal cortex or the human part of the brain is seeing the mammalian or the, rip, uh, the, um, uh, the, the mammal part of the brain that does all of the storage of rights, rules, rituals, ways to do things, shoulds, coulds, woulds, oughtas. That whole series of jobs to do. But it right. also applies to fear as well, right? Like I and, well, it makes the child feel afraid because you should do this, you ought to do that, and the child doesn't want to do it, but he's afraid that he's, that consequences. Right. And so making the, uh, the mind integrated or whole means that the parent is nurturing the child and the... Um, the adult is equanimously looking on and we become an integrated whole that we don't have arguments with ourselves we don't have insecurities that we in fact this whole point about having right view right sati and right effort running and circling around each other builds up that confidence and it also builds up that integration so that we become more and more integrated, more and more whole, especially when we add that fourth ingredient, and that is the can-do attitude, the sama sankapa, the right, I can do this, because why? Because I have been doing it, I am successful at it, and I know that I can do it, and that gives such a sense of relief that I can handle this, and that's part of that integration, re, um, reintegrating, what used to be an internal argument full of doubt is now relaxed and whole, completely free from doubt in this moment. Totally. That, um, that really reminds me of something I've been reminding myself a lot about the, I think it's a specifically Zen idea about like, there's no special moment in time. It's all, it's all just more moments. There's no particular like, you know, I just started school, so it was easy for me to be like, oh, my God, like this is like the beginning or whatever. But it's just like it's just another point. Mm -hmm. um, well, another way of saying it is, is yes, there is a very, 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 very important point in time. Uh, yeah. What is that right now? This is the only time. And in fact, this is not it's so important is because this is the only one we have. The past is dead now. It's gone. <laughs> and the future is yet to be. It's just magical thinking is of our future only exists in concept. But right now is the only time that we have. Some people call it the eternal now, but I wouldn't use the word eternal. Because even that's... And in fact, if you call it the eternal now, that's almost like calling it the uh, uh, what is the word for it? Uh, infernal, the burning, okay. If, if, uh, infernal time, or uh, rather than eternal time, because it's, it's burning, 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 burning. No, just look at it in the sense of, it's just now, it's time to relax. This is the only point in time, let me relax now. This is a good moment, or this is the only moment that I have right now, let me make it a good moment. Why should we have bad moments? Well, we're in the habit of having bad moments, but that's the only rationale is, is that we got used to having bad times when we were younger, and now we are just in that habit. But now it's time to change the habit. Change. That's the remarkable word. Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa picked up on that. It's very, very important to recognize that you've got a choice. You can change. You are not fixed just because you have been stuck in one way of thinking for 20 years doesn't mean the next 20 years you are bound to be stuck in that way of thinking. That you can change it and the only time that you can change it is right now. Totally. I'll. I'll 
I often um, get caught up in philosophy with that because I just think about free will and whether or not we have it. But <laughs> ah, but whether we not we have it is like a long term kind of thing. A better question to ask yourself is, is do I feel free right now? <sighs> Freedom. Wow, I feel so good. That's a good point. Yeah, it's a very good point. You know, Martin Luther King had a statement free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, free at last. But there's a better way of saying that. I know that he was Christian and all of that. But another way of saying it is uh, Nietzsche's way. And that is free at last, free at last. There is no God Almighty. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> okay. Now, the thing that we're talking about here is we're free from the God that we have in our own mind, our parent ego state, the authority. When you get rid of your own authority, then you're free. And when you're giving yourself a bunch of work to do, you're not free. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> so we could go so far to say free at last, free at last. There is no reason to be bound up. Free at last. that the bondage is always mental. Possibly the most outrageous example of that, uh, you've, had, you've heard of the far side. The guy used to do it 20 years ago, but they still make calendars out of, it's a cartoon, cartoon series. Is it Gary Larson? He, yes, right. And he had a lot of, I uh, had a lot of cows with udders, right? I, I, okay. Yeah, super big fan. Yeah, totally. Uh, all right. Well, there's one of them. In fact, there's now a whole bunch of them, various views of it. But the original one that I remember was a guy carrying a wheelbarrow down a tunnel, uh, uh, underground tunnel, a mine or something like that. Instead of diamonds sticking out the sides, there were bones. There were skeletons. And the pile that he had in his wheelbarrow were uh, skeletons and bones and things like that. And walking behind him were two guys in red suits with uh, uh, tridents and uh, red pointy tails. And, you know, you get the idea. And he's whistling and saying, how y'all to the guys in the side there? He's actually enjoying carrying his wheelbarrow in hell. And these two devils, the caption they're saying is, we're not getting through to this guy, are we? Yeah. We're not getting through to this guy that we've got him in hell here. And he hasn't figured that out yet. Right. So no matter yeah. what your attitude is, even even in hell. When they've got you chained to a wheelbarrow doing the work, still your mind is free. If you allow it to be free, the freedom is not in the wheelbarrow. The freedom is not in the government. The freedom is not in the devils that are sticking us with the pitchfork. The freedom is in one's mind. And the way to develop that is with sati and right effort and investigation. And then the development of that attitude of I can handle this. Because from time to time, you're going to find yourself in some sort of hell or another. Are you free to be happy even when you're in hell? Your choice. The way to practice that, though, is to stay out of hell long enough to where you really are safe. That we want to practice on what we can do. This is why the Buddha talks about getting into seclusion, to get away from it all, literally to get away from that task 
so that we can get ourselves into a really good state. So now we can go back and do that task happily. So rather than being stuck on a task that we hate, the best thing to do is to get away from it all, get ourselves in really, really good shape, freedom. And then we take our freedom back to the task. So that you can get done what you want to do. This is not withdrawing completely. It's only withdrawing enough to get the mind straightened out. And then we can do anything we want to do. And so this is a way of practicing. This is why the Eightfold Noble Path is so important. And yet most people don't understand it. I mean, we kind of memorize it. It's introductory Buddhism. And so we learn the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Noble Path. And now what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> Now what do we do is that we actually begin to practice so that we can get the benefits out of the April Noble Path. Rather than just having it as more information. Yeah, totally. It is. Uh, it's a. I don't want to say it's tricky, but it is so simple. Um, but there's, I guess, you know. There's a lot of other stuff going on that clouds things a lot of the times. So I suppose it's it's hard. I don't want to say it's hard, but it can be difficult to find that clarity of that simpleness. You know, we always look for complicated solutions. Right. That's why we want to practice it over and over and over and over again. It's so that we have the skills developed so that we can we um can put this into service just when we need it most. But this is Murphy's Law. <laughs> you know Murphy's Law? Yeah, definitely. A anything that can go wrong will go wrong. And then the second half is, is the, and it will go wrong at the worst possible moment. OK. What does that mean is, is that when you need Sati the most, that's when you're most likely going to forget all about it. Definitely. <laughs> that's why we want to develop it over and over and over again as a skill so that it'll be there when we need it the most. When we're most likely to forget about it, we'll remember. Yeah. An example of that is walking into the ER. That's when we need Sati a lot. Whether we're the one who's injured, we're walking in to see an injured, or we're walking in with an injured. It's still, that's a, another time is when you're tooling down the highway and you see red and, and blue lights flashing and you hear a siren. That's when you need some sati right then. Because if you act afraid with that cop, he's going to pick up on that fear. And if he sees you start moving, he's going to put his hand on his gun. It's a dangerous situation. But if you're all cheerful and happy to see the cop, then wow, I'm, officer, I'm really glad to see you guys out on duty tonight. We really lot rely upon your work. Thank you so much. And that's a good report to start with, with the cop. You might even not even get a ticket <laughs> if you're friendly and happy and good and glad to see him on duty. Make him feel good about himself, all right? But we can't do that when we're terrified. Yeah. Change. So, uh, oh, that was, oh, that's why the dogs didn't bark. That's <laughs> somebody just came, but uh, friend. So, uh, not a delivery guy. Uh, so anyway, back to the point about um, sati. That's the that's the skill that we need to practice. This is why we talk about it sati on the in breath and sati on the out breath. Sati on the in breath to remember to take a long deep breath. We're actually putting skin in the game. We're actually learning to control the breathing. That many meditation practices says just watch the breath, but without having any real control of the breath. The watching of it and the mind will just jump away very easily. 
But if we're intentionally building sati to say, I'm going to make sure that this is a long, deep in breath, I'm actually controlling the breath. By controlling the breath, we actually are also controlling the mind. By controlling the breath and making it a long, deep in breath, that also gives us a chance to control the mind so that we can take unwholesome thoughts out and put wholesome thoughts in. So now we're controlling the mind and we're controlling the breathing. And by controlling the mind and having and having happy, glad thoughts, we're actually beginning to control how we feel. We actually have been controlling how we feel all along, but then most people don't know that. They, they think instead that I am my feelings or ever how I feel is just how I feel. And I've got to go by how I feel. Follow your feelings, you know, follow your heart. This is just all kinds of information in our society about doing it that way. And that's why we have so much trouble. It would be better, better to operate through wisdom rather than operate through feelings that are out of control. Especially if we've been thinking on negative thoughts, a lot of negative thoughts, which now we're feeling bad. And then we think that we're uh, that our feelings are just our feelings without recognizing that we've got any control over them or not. But when we start practicing to recognize that we can, in fact, control the way that we feel by controlling the thoughts that we have. That, the, that feeling and thoughts are interrelated. That the body and the way that the body feels also controls the way that we feel emotionally and the way that we feel emotionally controls the way that we think. But also our thoughts can put it in reverse order. We can think ourselves into feeling good. And by thinking ourselves into feeling good, the body feels more comfortable and more relaxed. So this is why we're, uh, the Buddha was very strong on beginning to change, not just monitor, but to change what we're thinking. Free at last, free at last, because I'm not thinking about being bound up. I'm free at last. There is no God almighty that I'm having thoughts of that's telling me what to do that I can be free, that freedom is just natural. It's the natural state that you're in. Totally. I think I was, um, I was experiencing um, uh, I suppose fear really at the heart of it, truly fear. Um, with controlling my own breath and really making an effort to like control or whatever. Cause I was feeling, I think I had started to have the fear of, um, I'm doing this wrong, you know, or like, but that's just an unwholesome thought. Mm -hmm. And the fear I might, I might be doing this wrong. That actually the, um, the thought itself can be considered a doubtful thought or that's doubt and doubt is the basis of fear. We call it the fear of the unknown. Well, what you're doubting means that there's some unknown stuff there and we naturally feel afraid about it. Rather than recognizing, wait a minute, it's not my doubts that actually would be a good source of fear. Real dangers would be a good source of fear. That in 600,000 years ago, all of our dangers were immediately present. You're either about to step on a snake or you're about to be eaten by a lion or you're about to do this, that or the other thing, which means you've got immediate danger. But we're being very, we've been very successful in our uh, building of civilization so that we've been able to take the immediate dangers out, but we substitute them for uh, perceived dangers. And so now we're perceiving dangers that aren't really there and we still feel afraid. When there in fact there really is nothing to fear. Other than the things that we can think of to fear. <laughs> but when we have thoughts of fearlessness, when we have thoughts of everything is safe, everything is comfortable, that 
that those guys are not going to bother me. And I can feel safe and secure in this present moment. <sighs> Relaxation. <laughs> free at last. Free at last. To just do nothing at all. Because all of those gods, all of those parent ego states, was what was keeping us from feeling safe and secure. We literally talk ourselves into feeling danger. Now it's time to talk yourself into feeling good. Feeling safe, feeling secure. I think I'm getting there. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Continue to practice like this. We'll go more into the details of Anapanasati a little bit at the time, but this is the foundation of, of um, developing that sati over and over and over again. Develop that investigation to look over and over and over again. To keep changing the mind from unwholesome to wholesome thoughts over and over again. And that then slowly develops the confidence, the attitude of, hey, I can do this. I could do this at any point in time. It doesn't matter how bad things are. Even if I'm the beautiful young princess being grabbed by the arms, getting ready to be thrown into the volcano, at least I can enjoy the view of the beautiful volcano. <laughs> There's another story, and that is the monk was being chased by the tiger, and he chased him up to the cliff, and so the monk went ahead and went right off the cliff. But on the way down, he was able to grab hold of a limb of a root uh, sticking out from the cliff, and there he is, grab hold, and he's perched himself, and the tiger is just right above him in a great abyss below, and he happens to notice that there's a flower. And so he just looks at the flower. He's really liking the flower, beautiful flower. And after paying attention to the flower for a while, the tiger wanders away. And now he can crawl back up to the surface. All right. And the other part of the story is so far, so good. So far, so good. Okay. I heard, yeah, I heard a variation of that story where it's like, he runs off the cliff and is hanging off the vine and there's a tiger above him and there's a tiger below him and then there's mice eating the vine and then he picks a strawberry and eats it and it's like, wow, it's amazing. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I like right. the, that one has a good ending. <laughs> well, no, tigers get tired of people eating uh, strawberries <laughs> and they'll wander off. That's fair enough. Yeah, that's basically what happens to all the dangers is, is that the, if we're if we're uh, enjoying the flower and enjoying the strawberry, the danger just kind of wanders off. Not sure. so dangerous after all. But we go through life terrified. Why? Because we were terrified when we were kids. And we weren't wise enough to recognize that there was no reason to be terrified. Now you're old enough and you're wise enough to see there is really nothing there to be terrified with. But we have to remind ourselves of that over and over again because the habit is, is to feel fear when there's really no fear there except the thoughts that cause a fear. So that we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to feel uptight. We don't have to be in a hurry. We could just simply relax in this moment and be happy right here, right now. That's what we're practicing. Doesn't take a particular posture. Any posture will do. Big point is to remember. So if somebody's watching uh, YouTube and some and uh, the thought comes, you ought to be meditating. And, the, and then the child says, I don't want to meditate. I want to watch the video. And then the next thought with the uh, parent ego state is, you ought to be watching the video. The right thing to do is, I mean, you ought to be meditating. Exactly. 
And the answer to that is, ah, thanks for the mind reminding me. And I take a deep breath and feel really good right then. That's the meditation. You do not have to even close the computer. You can just take that deep breath and feel really good right now. And remember to do that often. But it's better to practice in the beginning about 15 or 20 minutes because three or four minutes is not really a long enough time to actually begin to feel good even when we're talking ourselves into feeling good because we've been feeling bad for so long. So it may take a little while, five or 10 minutes. And so spend some time doing it to where you can actually come out of your meditation session feeling really good. Yeah, I usually do at least like an hour and a half. So um, like daily. Break, breaking it up into smaller sessions. If you're okay. practicing already an hour and a half, that's 90 minutes. Right. That means that you could do uh, six sittings at 15 minutes each. And get a whole lot more out of it to break it up throughout the day, because in fact, the sati, the skill that we're developing, we want it to be there any time that we need it. So the more often we practice it, and if by practicing shorter periods of time, it's actually a better, more intense practice. An example of that is somebody who is um, uh, running practice. Well, running for 90 minutes, that's pretty exhausting. And if he's going to be a, uh, uh, a sprinter, a uh, 50-yard, 100-yard dash, running for 90 minutes is not going to build up that speed. And we're looking for speed here. We're looking for both speed and power. And so uh, practicing when we've gotten tired is not the best time. The best time to, is to get ourselves into, into a good state or when we're uncomfortable and then practice so that we're getting immediate benefit out of it several times a day. One of the times that I would recommend for sure is just when you first wake up in the morning, the first thing that you do is you start practicing before you even get out of bed. Mm -hmm. Also, when you go to bed at night, before you go to sleep, we practice getting the mind into a really wholesome state then too. And then several other times during the day, like at lunch, spend 15 minutes at lunch, it's just giving yourself real nourishment. OK, so this is the way that I would um, prefer that students practice is as many times of the day as you can for shorter and shorter periods of time. So that maybe 10 seconds every minute. This minute you spend 10 seconds in great joy and then in the next minute you spend 10 seconds in great joy. I mean, this is possible. Do you see any benefit then to a longer meditation? Like, is there any possibility of other benefits that you would be able to get from longer meditation that you wouldn't be able to from shorter meditation sessions? Uh, only actually not so much. <clears throat> One would say that it might be a good idea to practice so long, just long enough to where we can get ourselves into a good state. And a lot of people will practice for an hour and a half and still not get themselves into a good state. That this, I, I don't know why, but it has to do with endurance or comparisons. Oh, I can sit longer than you can. OK, because it's really hard to compare with how good I feel as compared to how good you feel. And if we both feel really good, nobody cares as to who <laughs> feels better. <laughs> That's true. And so it, it this how long you sit is part of the um, the critical mind is part of the competition. And so I would rec I would say then that I don't see much advantage in sitting for long periods of time. rather than uh, enjoying what time that you do have. And if you can sit enjoying yourself for long periods of time, then that's great. 
but we but we develop uh, that by sitting shorter periods of time and get ourselves into feeling really, really great. And then we can extend that. And so that's what we're looking at is how long can you sustain feeling really, really great? That's applied and sustained thought. And in fact, that's the skill to be developed. Once you get yourself into a really good state, how long can you maintain that state? Now, that doesn't mean you have to sit for a long period of time. In fact, can you get yourself, let us say that you're doing a typical uh, Western style view of meditation. You've got a meditation hall or a hut or a room that's got a cushion and an incense and an altar and a dais and all of that kind of stuff, you know, and you're doing it regularly. All right. Let us say 10 minutes into an hour and a half setting. Once you've got yourself into a really, really good step state, can you actually stand up in that good state and walk around in that good state? Or do you have to only do it while you're sitting? Can you actually go for a walk and get yourself into a really, really good state while you're out walking? So it, it doesn't have anything to do with how long you sit or a meditation. That that's really a strictly Western mentality. It started about 50 years ago uh, in Burma uh, where they started. Did you know that before 1950, there were no 10 uh, day retreats anywhere in the world? That 10 day meditation retreats are a new phenomenon. And Western Buddhism has picked up on that as if it was God's holy grail of Buddhism. Where in fact, no. The Buddha recommends go to the forest, to an empty hut, to a pile of straw, sit under a tree, and just get in seclusion, get away from it all. But nowhere does it say sit there for an hour or until something happens. It just goes to a forest, get yourself into seclusion, so that you can practice getting your mind into a really good state. Once you're in that good state, now you can have wise choices about, am I going to sit here? Am I going to stay in the forest? Am I going to uh, be in that empty hut? Or am I going to go out and do something? But now we're making those choices wisely rather than out of bad feelings, being driven to do something. Now we truly do have the freedom to do what we want to do because we're free from the bad feelings that used to drive us to do everything. And it has really nothing to do with actual authorities because the, the issue is not the authorities on the outside. The issue is the authority mind state that we've created. That's what keeps us from feeling free. Is that part of us that gives us work to do? If you don't work, you don't eat. You're going to die, boy. You got to go out and huff that bell. I mean, huff two, three, four, go get her done. You know, that's how we think that we've been taught that. And the answer to that is, hey, man, never mind. And so there's two major skills to be developed. One is the major skill of getting into a really good state. And then the second major skill is to sustain that or maintain it. And that these two skills then have nothing to do with sitting on the floor for a long period of time. But it's like sitting on the floor for a long period of time, more than likely, most people are going to become uncomfortable sitting there. And yet the whole quality of um, uh, safety, security, satisfaction is about comfort. And so getting yourself comfortable will help you get relaxed and get satisfied. Shifting your posture is optional. You don't have to sit there feeling uncomfortable and then say, now that I feel really miserable and my both my knees hurt and my back hurts, now I can really practice Anapanasati, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and some reason that's how that's the Western mentality. <laughs> But doesn't that exist in the East as well? I mean, yeah, in terms of. Yes, it does. 
I would say at least 80% of the Asians have that, and about 20% or more don't. But in America or in the West, 100% of the people, and very few of us have that, that ability to uh, sit down and develop the skills that we actually need. So think of it as the skill, the two skills, the twin skills of one, getting yourself into a really good state. And then the skill of maintaining that state. Those are the two skills to develop, not the skill but, of sitting on the floor a long time. But the tools we use to develop those skills are the same, right? In terms of using investigation, sati, and effort, and then attitude, right. of course. Mm -hmm. Of course. But in, in the sutras, they talk about it in the sense of applied thought and sustained thought, which means that you apply the mind to the wholesome, but then you continue to work at sustaining it, keeping it on the wholesome, keeping it on the wholesome, because if you don't, the likelihood is the old habit will pop back up. An example would be uh, that you go to a tree and that tree has not not a very fat one, but let's say a, um, a limb that's about an inch around, something that can be bent. If you bend that limb down, it will bend. If you turn loose of that limb, it will spring back up almost to the point where it was before. But if you keep bending it down and bending it down and bending it down over and over again, pretty soon the limb st starts to bend with you so that its return point will return to uh, not the original, but a let us in our system of thinking, uh, even a, a slightly more wholesome place than it was in the beginning. And the more we keep practicing, even though when we turn loose, it will go back, it won't go back as far. And so we keep keep moving it, keep bending it, keep putting it in just the right position. It springs back. Never mind. We'll put it back again over and over again. And pretty soon we have that limb trained. So also is the mind. We can also think about it in the sense that unused neural pathways tend to die out. Even the very heavy duty ones that are used all the time. If you don't use those neuro neurological pathways, if you if you choose a different path, then those neurons will slowly die out to where the new path that you're using now will develop new uh, neuron pathways. Or you can think of it this way that you've got a, um, uh, a trail or a path, uh, let us say um, a dual carriage way, um, excuse me, not a dual dual carriage, but a dual path for a truck, not just a motorcycle or one car uh, or um, uh, one horse path, but for two horses is a pathway. OK, if that pathway has ruts in it. Then people will make a new pathway around. Once that new pathway is made around, then the old place will heal. That in fact, if you stop using that entire path through the woods, after a while, you won't be able to find where that path was. Trees will grow, grass will grow, and it will be very hard to find your way through that old path. And that old path may have had tons of traffic at one time, but now because there's no traffic there, it reverts back to nature. This is also true of the, of the mind. So if you keep giving yourself unwholesome thoughts that make you feel fearful over and over and over again and build that pathway up. If now you start having thoughts of safety and security, those old thoughts and old feelings of fear will slowly start to give way, to die out, and the new pathways will start to take hold. This is nature. Everything operates that way. You keep bending something in that direction, it will eventually start to go in that direction. But in fact, when we were babies, we felt nurturing. And we continued to feel nurtured for a while, even though we were put to work with our ABCs and our one, two, threes. But eventually the work at hand took over the child and now the child has to work and nothing is, in, is a toy anymore. But we could reverse that too. It just takes a while. 
yeah absolutely i'm i'm i see that a lot of it is uh in terms of uh deciphering what is unwholesome from wholesome you know and being able to do that intuitively without thinking about it i think because yeah Mm -hmm. well when you're thinking about it always make sure that the thoughts are wholesome thoughts Thoughts of, I can do this. Thoughts of, wow, nothing to do, no place to go. Gosh, I don't really have anything to do right now. Isn't that marvelous? Definitely, because I can get really into, like, investigating, like, is, you know, this a wholesome thought? Like, uh, I can think about, like, um, whether or not when I put a wholesome thought in and I'm in a wholesome, a good-feeling state, and then I can feel uh, a fear or an aversion to going into an un unwholesome state. Like, I know that that fear or aversion to going into an un unwholesome state is an unwholesome state itself, right? But at the same time, you know, we're working towards putting ourselves out of unwholesome states. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's hard. And so you can recognize that thought and that feeling right now. Oh, there you go again. That's an unwholesome thought. Never mind. I can take a deep breath and relax again. That's sati for you is to remember to look at this thought. This thought, this thought, this thought of this feeling right here, right now in this particular second of time. And so that's sati, to wake up and look. And then we have a choice. If we don't wake up and we don't look, then we don't have a choice. And that choice and making that choice is actually the right effort to come out of the bad feelings into safety, security, comfortableness, satisfaction, and then uh, ultimately success. We could do this. Wow, it feels good. I know I can do it. That feel, oh, wow, it feels so great that I know that I can feel good anytime I want to. That's freedom. Bobby McGee, do you know that song? Maybe. It doesn't ring Freedom's bell, just another word for nothing left to lose. Freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. Well, if I lost all of my crap, then I, I'm free. So that stuff out and now I can be free. So I like that. Freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. I'm empty now. That in fact you want that want to be untethered like a like a hot air balloon. We can we can fly, but we have to let go of the fetters, drop a few sandbags, and then we can just fly off into the air in our own mind. That freedom is dropping the burdens that keep us from being able to walk away. And when we lose all of that stuff, we really are free. It's great. <laughs> it's really great. <laughs> well, this is the practice. There is more to it. There's a lot of different skills to learn, but these are the main skill, the skill of to remember, to investigate, and then take the effort to change it from unwholesome to wholesome. And as that happens, we build up the confidence that I can handle anything. The skill of sukha. Mm -hmm. What is the skill of sukha? Satisfaction based on comfort, based on security. And on top of that is success. This is step five and six of Anapanasati, and along with it brings on um, relaxation of the body, which is step four. 
but they don't come in the sequence that it's taught, like number four, five, and six. You can see, in fact, this five and six is a prerequisite for step four. And that a prerequisite for five and six is going to be step 10, which is gladdening the mind. And a pre prerequisite for gladdening the mind is that investigation, which is step nine of Anapanasati. And so this is a way of looking at it is, is one by one as they occur. Starting with sati, investigation, taking the effort, gladdening the mind, relaxing. This is the way of going, and this is skill to be developed, the skill of applying the mind to get it into that state and then the skill of sustaining it. Posture is optional. <laughs> Eyes open or closed, optional. I can do it. I can do it. Great. I can do it. Yeah. You know, this has been a really delightful call. I really enjoyed it. I'm really glad to see you smiling. I mean, you're getting it now. I can tell. <laughs> totally, totally, totally. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Excellent. All right. Well, we'll see you soon. And we'll Definitely. continue on with this. Excellent. Definitely. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay, is there a Sangha thing tomorrow? Yes. Right. Okay. At, At uh, seven? What, what time zone seven. are you in? Uh, Pacific. Okay. So 7 p.m. Okay, tomorrow. Cool. Yeah. Be 10, on, 10 on Saturday yeah. morning here. Very cool. Excellent. I hope to see you there. I, I hope to be there as well. Okay. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Yeah. Later.